I'm Brian Howell here with Pro Video Coalition. I am with Sony. I'm with Sam with Sony. And we are talking updates to the Venice camera and the FX9, both uh, large format cameras, very popular. If you've seen the new Top Gun trailers, you've seen the Venice in action. Sam has a uh, really nice presentation to show us what's great about these Zoom NAB at home sessions is we can kind of take a deeper dive than we could on the NAB floor where 15 minutes might be the max amount of time that we get. So Sam, I see you have a firmware update announcement here. So I want to show you a couple of things that are on this list uh, in more detail. One of them primarily is the new advanced rendering transform. This is going to be really cool uh, because now you're able to take um, advantage of all of the, the power horse video processing within the Venice for your onset monitoring, um, which will allow you to take any 3D cube file and actually transform it to a better type of look for the Venice output, um, whether it be SDR or HDR monitoring on set. Um, and then we also added some new preset frame lines. So for uh, a lot of the Quibi productions are requesting that they can also have frame lines for nine by 16 as well as 16 by nine. Um, and they wanna be able to extract that all from the full frame. So that's a great uh, addition uh, into the version six for, for the users. Um, and, I'll, and I'll go into detail on a couple of these, but I wanna show you here the new frame rates that we're also adding. So if you already purchased the high frame rate license, um, you can now go up to 110 frames a second in 3.8K, uh, 16 by nine, as well as in if you're doing anamorphic 6.5, you can go up to 72 frames a second now with version six. And the also the 5.7K, 16.9 can also take you up to 72 frames a second. Uh, those are both limited to 30 and the uh, 16 by nine, 3.8K was limited to 60 before, so. That's a nice These are all new frame rates. Um, yeah. Everyone likes their high frame rates. I do too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And in the highest quality, you know, here we're talking 16 bit XOCN uh, file format. So we're, we're still maintaining that same high quality 16 bit for post. And regarding the, the uh, new advanced rendering transform, which is now going to be called a ART file, so art file. Um, that's going to be something that you can create right now only in the raw viewer from Sony, but we're working with uh, giving the SDKs out to DaVinci as well as Adobe and Avid so that they can also be able to create a ART file. Now, what an ART file is basically, um, before you were limited to what a 3D LUT was able to do when ingested into the Venice um, and then output via either the monitoring output or the uh, SDI 3 and 4. Um, now, in in addition, we're also allowing the 3D LUT to be shown in the viewfinder, which means that with this ART file, we can also show that in the viewfinder, which is going to prevent things like the banding that you're seeing in this image here with the blue and the, and the red light. Mm -hmm. So the reason that happens is because the 3D LUT file only... Um, it, it, it actually comes in after the video processing has already been done from the S-Log uh, off of the chip. So here you see that it only comes in to the 3D LUT right before the SDI and viewfinder um, output. Um, it, and it doesn't affect the HD monitoring part. So for version six, you actually get that ART file to, to be used throughout the whole video process pipeline. Um, and that's gonna affect multiple processes, thus yielding a better output from, from your monitoring on set. So if you're going to an HDR monitor or even an HDR TV that's in like Dolby Vision or, or HDR 10, for example, you can output different LUTs and ART files to be able to go to those different um, monitors. What's I have a, really I have a quick cool- quick question. So if you're sure. using the ART file, does the viewfinder in the Venice support that HDR? Like if you're sending it to a Dolby Vision monitor, does the viewfinder match that? It does or? not. Not, no, okay. the viewfinder is not an HDR viewfinder. Okay. Um, so, so it is. So you will be uh, limited to, to SDR on that. But what what you can do is that you can output um, on set to Rec 709, but then have the ART file in HDR for post as well. Okay. So you can also use it in in post, and whether it be a 33 uh, cube or a, or a 65 cube, you can have those created in any grading tool, um, and then just export it from the raw viewer. So it could be coming from a DaVinci um, or also uh, Baselight, and then you take that cube file into raw viewer, export it, and then do the same importation as you would with a 3D LUT file um, today. Is it just because the the architecture of the software for the Sony Venice with the 3D art 3D LUT file? Um, cube file, 
that it's just because of the architecture, it's only being kind of applied after a certain time place. But the dot R A R T or art because it's something Sony's created is able to put that further down into the processing. Is that correct? Exactly. You got it right there, Brian. That's that's exactly what's happening. Um, so the engineers were able to find out how they can touch the whole video processing pipeline um, with a file. And that's why they created this ART file that goes where the three to love file wasn't able to go into the, into the video processing outputs. So that's exactly what, what, what it is. So it's actually a, a tweaked version of, of what a LUT was doing in the camera um, to take advantage of the full video processing from the camera and not only the output side of it. Okay. So yeah, you got it right. On, you hit the the nail right on the head there. That seems like a very important thing. You, no one likes for a client to see something different than what they're seeing. I mean, it might be slightly different if you have the SDR viewfinder, but you want them to see what they're going to see in the suite. You know, no one likes questions about the image that need to be explained. I agree, Brian. A hundred percent. Yeah. So the, the the reason why we're doing this also is, is coming from a. Uh, a new collaboration between Technicolor and Sony. And Technicolor is creating looks for the Venice using the ART file now. And that'll be uh, provided free of charge to any user. They can download it from either the Technicolor website or the Sony website. Um, and initially, target display right now is Rec. 709 only monitors, but we are in discussion with them for uh, doing target HDR displays like PQ, Dolby Vision. Um, Rec 2020. So that is something that that we're working in collaboration. So we're using you know all of the muscle from the the Technicolor colorists and the experience that they've had for years, and including things like traditional film print emulation and stylized and blended. Um, those are temporary names right now, but basically the idea is to give really high quality look for the Venice, incorporating this new ART file. So is uh, is Sony just are they reinventing the 3D LUT in, into something better or like with more information that can be applied or is it just uh, taking the information and making it easier to apply it within the Venice architecture? This is created specifically for the Venice architecture. Um, we are currently in, in process of studying whether it will also go to the FX9, but as of right now, this is only for the Venice um, structure. So it wouldn't, the ARTs, wouldn't work in other cameras because they wouldn't take advantage of the full processing of each individual camera that has their own way of outputting a, a LUT. So this is this is a basically created specifically for the Venice by Technicolor as, and the engineers uh, of, of the Venice. Okay, thank you. No, thank you. Great question, Brian. I appreciate it. So this is kind of like the look that we're we're expecting. It's it's going to be between three to five looks. Uh, we're hoping for five, and they'll be released simultaneously with the version six of the Venice. Remember when we talked about the new frame lines? So right now you can only have two frame lines simultaneously: a, a, a preset like sixteen by nine or seventeen by nine, and then a user frame line. What we're adding is an additional user frame line um, for when you're shooting for social media or mobile video, like uh, Quibi. Now the new Quibi platform, uh, they allow you to switch uh, from landscape to portrait mode while you're watching the video, and it'll actually maintain the subject. Um, in either focus or in, in view of, of what the story is telling. So this is really cool because now we can have three different um, frame lines. And from that, we can tell where our subject needs to be placed within the full frame capture uh, of the Venice. So we're actually extracting uh, a portrait and a landscape out of that full frame capture, which is really helpful, uh, especially for the guys in post who, who already need to have those two extractions easily, easily created. And when you mean ext extraction, do you mean... Like it's recorded that way too, or is it just a frame line so you can see where where you need to frame it for those um, portraits? Exactly. And yeah, it, it's it's not recorded this way. It's actually um, the frame line is there while you're shooting so that you can see where where the subject is. But okay. that information um, can also be passed on, and they'll be able to to, to easily extract it in their editing process okay. from that full frame capture. So the 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 one on the left is what you're actually getting. Um, that's the that's the full frame um, file that you, that you'll have in your editing bay, and then you'll be able to just remove um, the extra um, parts that you don't want, and and do a landscape and a portrait. Okay. Great question. Thank you. I see the gyro tilt roll stored stored as metadata. 
Um, yes. Is so that, that so... Was, that's going to be for uh, VFX. So the information will be recorded as metadata as of version six. Uh, currently, it's it's not being recorded, but the chip is in there. So it, you know, once we unlock that feature, that it'll, it'll be part of the the metadata on XOCN and XAVC, but not ProRes. Okay. And then also, yeah, I see the Zeiss extended metadata for the Fujinon Prumista lenses. So you Correct. Can, so, I mean, if you're going to have something on a gimbal, sometimes you have a zoom on it, too, if you have it yep. strong enough gimbal. Um, and then that's a very useful for visual effects. Exactly. And that's definitely one of the uh, the requests that we had uh, was to be, be able to incorporate that extra metadata from the Fujinon Prumista, which are amazing lenses. And uh, Claudia Miranda was, was uh, checking them out, and he also was impressed when we uh, did a master class in, in Chile. Um, we used the, the Fujian Permissa. I actually had to hand carry the lens uh, with me on the plane um, <laughs> all the way to Santiago. And those are some amazing lenses. And then uh, the D-squeeze on off uh, is now a user button. So you don't have to go into the menu to, to do the anamorphic D-squeeze. So if you want to just check it out um, on any screen and have a user button assigned to it. Um, and then also maintaining the cam ID and, and real number if you're loading all files and sharing uh, the file setup with the uh, different Venice cameras on set. So you can like save everything onto an SD card and then uh, load it into the other Venice so you, you're matching all the cameras. Okay, that's really handy. Yeah, it is. Yeah, a lot of people like that because sometimes they don't want to have to go into the menu and make all those changes. Oh. Um, having that you know little SD card on set with you just pop it into any camera and reset everything to your customized uh you know desires so anything anything you can speed up in production or the process the uh, camera it helps out i mean i use sony cameras all the time and yeah i mean God, I mean, it begins with time code but camera reels and everything you save money and uh, mm -hmm. i'm sure that a lot of camera assistants are going to love that feature and you know what's really cool is that the venice is to me the most complete camera on the market right now because it has so many usability features like the you know the nd in built-in eight stops and also the the do iso so it, it really just makes it flexible when you're working with it on set um and it to me it seems like it, it i don't know you you've you have also used it like have have you felt the same way about about using the venice on set it just doesn't make your job so much easier right i mean anytime you can deliver a venice style image quality People are going to be impressed. I mean, it's a, it's it's kind of a no-brainer, um, you know, especially because something like this, it just makes it easy. You know, you, there's a certain like you get to a place, and some cameras just make your life easy, and it's a no-brainer. And the Venice is one of those. Yeah, exactly. Nobody's going to get fired to use a Venice on set now, right? <laughs> You'd have to be doing a lot of work to get fired. <laughs> if you don't, I mean, if you don't know the camera, if you haven't taken the time to learn it, and in the yeah. ins and outs, then. You know, know your gear. Exactly. So now we have so the, let's, the FX9, which is a the FX9. beautiful camera, too. It really is. It really is. It's a great uh, B camera as well for the Venice. It's, um, it's style is based on the color science of the Venice, so you really can have it as a as an excellent B camera, um, incorporating also the, the autofocus functions, which have been really well received by the market. So a um, lot of new features coming out for FX9, which we promised uh, since launch, and a lot of them are coming to fruition with the version 2 updates. Uh, expanded shooting options, I'll tell you about that. Uh, one of them is mainly the DCI. Uh, format being able to do now 4096 by 2160 as opposed to just 3840. Okay. And then the IAF is added to the autofocus option. So first it was just face autofocus, and now it's also face and eye autofocus, oh, which we, the technology handy. we brought from the alpha side. And it really works amazing because it gives you pin sharp. I mean, the eye close to the lens is, is what's going to get the, the sharp focus, and it's really amazing, uh, especially when you're working with, with some of these you know, um, deep focus lenses. So. And then touchscreen enabled on a viewfinder is really cool because now you can uh, set up your autofocus with touch as well as doing um, touch for the settings of the camera. So like frame rate, uh, base ISO, uh, and a lot more new features that are coming out. So let's go one by one real quick so you can kind of see what we're adding here. So originally the camera had two imager scan modes, which was the full frame 6K and the super 35 4K. Now, even if we were recording in HD, we would have had that same angle of view. Yes. However, um, we were limited to 30P when we shot 4K, and we were only able to do high frame rate in, uh, in HD. So now with the 5K crop, we can get up to uh, 60 frames a second in 4K. Uh, 
So now we could do 4K 60p uh, using the 5K crop. Okay, so you don't have to, gonna, you're like just right there in, in between the two. Exactly, exactly. So it's like 83% of full frame and 122% uh, larger than Super 35. Okay, that's, so, a nice, yeah, it, that's a nice compromise of the two. I think so, because like, look what it gives us here. Um, so everything with the little asterisk uh, right there that says full frame, um, 50 and 60p frame rates, that's all because of the, the 5K crop. Um, and then what we were limited to before was only the Q, QFHD in full frame. Now we get DCI up to 30p um, in, in full frame as well as Super 35. Uh, we can go to 120 when we're in full HD uh, for both full frame and Super 35 crops. So you have both those angles of views in different resolutions. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to worry about changing the lens if you change the format. Um, you can go from a 4K format to an HD format or a QFHD format and know that you're maintaining that same um, angle of view on the on the sensor as well as the the lens. The uh, FS7 Mark II uh, originally had the 180p, uh, but when the FX9 came out, we were limited to 120. So now we are doing the 180 and 150 full HD as well. So that that definitely is a is a great addition because now we're up, up to par with what the FS7 Mark II was able to do as well. Is this um, is that 180p? Is that continuous recording in full HD? Correct. That is continuous recording. Yep. No buffer on that. So for the raw output now, which we are um, enabling from the XDCA FX9 optional uh, accessory, that's the back that goes onto the to the back of the FX9. Mm -hmm. um, from that one cable now, we're able to do a 16-bit raw output in either full frame or in Super 35, also incorporating the f uh, 5K crop and here as well, which will also take us up to 180 frames a second uh, when we're shooting in DCI 2K uh, at 16-bit RAW. So that's going to be great for post, um, especially when you're trying to match the 16-bit coming out of the Venice. This RAW recording is through the XDCA, for the external recorder, but you're going to an Atomos recorder, correct? The, the XDCA is actually not a recorder. It's just a accessory add-on that, that gives you other new features uh, like slot in wireless and also Ethernet connection, uh, dual USB for dongle support, doing to, uh, live streaming to a TV station, for example, or uploading to a cloud uh, or an FTP server. Um, so that XDCA is actually giving you a lot of extra features. In addition to that, uh, the 16-bit raw output is, is one of them that will be enabled now. So a quick question about the XDCA. Is that sure. available now for FX9 users to pick up or? Yes, it is. It is? How much yeah, is it, that? It, it was available since launch. It's about 2,500. Will this raw recording only be available in Atomos recorders um, for the foreseeable future? That's the information I have as of now. Okay. Um, I don't know of any other recorder uh, manufacturer that's working on uh, capturing that 16-bit as of yet. Okay. I mean, it's a, it's a lot and tough to capture a 16-bit when you're raw. Yeah. So I'm not imagining the whole bunch of people um, capable of doing that just yet. Exactly. Yeah. And we partnered with uh, Atomos from the beginning. So we've been working with them very closely uh, since the, the alpha days when, when we were outputting uh, the 8-bit output to their recorders. So it's, it's been a, it's been a really good partnership with them and, and collaborating with them on the, on this technology. So looking forward to seeing how, how successful that the 16 bit raw output uh, becomes for, for FX nine. I think it's going to give it a real leg up in the uh, industry. So well, I can't wait to see it. Yeah, me too. So here we're able to now import our 3D LUTs uh, to the FX9. Uh, before we were limited to the LUTs that were in or the looks that were in, in the camera, uh, which was S Cinetone um, and then S709, we can do that. That's, it's based on the same color space as, as the Venice. Uh, but now we can actually import any LUTs that we've created in Raw Viewer, DaVinci, uh, and have those output to our viewfinder um, and, and monitors so we can see uh, the LUT on the SLOG3 file. What we did remove from the menu, which was, to, you know, a lot of users really didn't get it and, and also didn't uh, understand why we we're calling it custom. And I had to explain it several times uh, to why we we're calling it custom. So now we've just removed the word custom from the menu uh, and it's going to be called either SDR or HDR. So custom uh, is basically Rec 709. Uh, you can add the S Cinetone um, look on there 
for the SDR mode, and then HDR will be using the hybrid log gamma or HLG, and that'll have two separate looks: the natural or live. Live would be similar to the system cameras that are used in broadcast, who are also using HLG. That way, you can easily match with those cameras if you happen to be working in that type of production. Uh, the HLG uh, gives us that flexibility in post without having to go through the color grading, of course. Um, and it looks nice on a SDR TV and an HDR TV. So uh, that's one of the, the benefits of working with HLG. Now, if you want to work with the real HDR that's uh, used in streaming or in the cinema, you would go with the Cine EI recording S-Log3, and then you would um, create your a HDR file format from there um, in post-production, whether you go to PQ or whether you do uh, Adobe Vision, um, and HDR10, HDR10 plus. Okay. So that's that's all the, the best way to get all of the dynamic range from the camera is still Cine EI mode. And, and if Cine EI mode is still, are you locked in the ISO ranges you can use, like the base ISO only, or can you custom? You can go through all the ISO ranges, right? You can. You can go through the ISO ranges. However, if you're shooting an S-Log3, it's going to be um, at either 800 or 4,000. Okay. Um, so if you change it to SDR or HDR mode, then you can change the gain. And we're actually increasing the gain now. We've got a gain improvement uh, when working in H HDR, SDR mode that now you can go up to 102,400 um, with the base and at high. And then if the base at low, you can go up to 12,800. Um, 12, and that's going to be an added um, gain to the to the image, especially if you want to do like nighttime time lapse or really really low light um, candlelight or, or lasers or something like that. Um, it's definitely uh, going to be a nice a nice plus. You can see the difference here in the red from version one to version two and, and what we're uh, adding. So Cine EI at this point will stay uh, will maintain its uh, eight hundred or, or four thousand ISO as as the basis. But if you're um, in HDR or SDR. Um, there you go. You can access, and a lot of people still shoot high log gamma or SD standard. Yeah, because exactly. So the, this definitely gives gives them the flexibility to to be able to do that right away and not have to go through post. Yeah. I agree. Sometimes you have to shoot and deliver footage right away. So yeah, for those who might not work for a network or any other like news organization, the the delivery is now. <laughs> There's no time to sit around and tweak your image and yeah. then deliver it later it's now and so those sdr and those um gain ranges are really helpful if you're working on a news magazine show or if you're doing a you know hard news coverage or anything where you have to turn just essentially hand off a a drive to yeah. a producer and you, and you might never see that footage again because you know sometimes handing off s-log three can scare a producer because they might not know as much about the tech as you do. Very true. And that, and the, like you said, a lot of people just ask for it now. You know, they just want a, a Rec 709 or a HLG uh, version right off the bat. And so it does, it does make it easier for them in, in post. Now, if you do have a lot of time, uh, then definitely go with the, the S log version. Now this is you know, a lot of people. Oh yeah. I was, I was a slow adopter of autofocus. I'll be honest. Slow adopter. I know me too. Uh, I, I didn't believe in it either. <laughs> But now it's gotten so incredible. It's like you can't, it, you can't not use it. You have to use it. It really has. It really has. It's almost like having a focus assistant inside the camera. And it's in, in um, some of the, the shots, people are saying, well, I, you know, I can't, I, I'm going to lose my job now as a, as a focus puller. Uh, and, I, and I told them, you know what, guys, don't worry. Now you just have to learn how to customize the autofocus because it is customizable. And you can change speed and how you set it up, whether it be face or eye detection, uh, your focus area, whether it be flexible or you set it up. Um, so the IAF uh, is really going to come in handy. It's the world's first professional camcorder with eye tracking technology. So the, the FX9 is, is definitely going to come really clutch uh, in a lot of situations where you can't just be manually focusing, you know? You know, it's come to the point where if I look at a camera that I want to use, um, having autofocus is, is becoming more and more important because it's a lot of times you just, especially large format, it's, it's hard to pull It really is, yeah, like you said, especially large format. Yeah, very hard. 
And now with the focus touch control, when we're using flexible spot, originally you had to use the joystick to remove, move the flexible spot around, which took a lot of time to go from one side of the screen to the other. Um, now you can actually do it with touch. And once it catches the face, then it goes for the eye. And so both um, features are available uh, simultaneously, which is really cool for just being, if you're in an interview with two people and you want to just rack focus between the two of them, it'll really come in handy. In an interview setup, a news magazine interview setup, you get people moving back and forth and having something that catches them on their eye, because that's obviously what you want to be focused in on is, is exactly. incredibly important because to roll, a, say you're on like a Sony lens or a Canon Sony lens and you're trying to roll that focus by hand, very small. It is, it mm -hmm. is, it's a job killer sometimes. You might, you might miss it and you might totally blow someone's important moment. So I agree a hundred percent. I think you, you got it right. Um, it is very hard, especially when, when your interview is moving around and, uh, you don't want to lose that. And, and, uh, and so I've had to reshoot interviews because somebody didn't have their focus on point and had to go back in like the next day you know, in the morning at NAB to, to do, you know, these out of focus interviews from the day before. <laughs> that's, and that's hard. Like it, it mean, if you, if you're shooting large format and you're, you know, pulling focus for yourself on with the handle lens or someone else's, and you don't have a large monitor to see if it's yeah. in focus, if you're just going off a seven inch monitor or 12 inch monitor, you, you might, you might want to look at the autofocus features because it might yeah. save your life a little bit. Yeah. Or at least use peaking, right? At least use yeah, peaking. Yeah. At least use peaking. <laughs> Something. <laughs> So we are um, adding an assignable function to the to the autofocus, which is really cool because now you don't have to go into the menu. So one of the voice of customer requests was that uh, they wanted to change the transition speed or the subject sensitivity, um, but then they didn't want to have to go all the way into the menu to change it while they're shooting. So if you want to rack focus fast or you want to slow it down to you know from one to seven, uh, you can do that now with an assignable button and using the jog wheel. So uh, you would push the assignable button once and then you would be able to change transition speed if you pushed it twice uh, you could change the subject sensitivity which makes it really easy to, to actually adjust and customize your autofocus settings oh, that's really easy because if you want to be able to do it on the fly no one likes to really step into a menu stop go yeah. from the menu change it see if it works you just want to tap it and change yep. it and you probably some people will change it i will i will do this all the time change something yeah. while i'm shooting and while i'm recording something oh yeah yeah, and then and then just be testing it out as you as you record. That's great. Yeah, because it's just it's just like it's just up here, you know, as best as you can. You, you have that muscle memory. Tap it, change it. Yeah, and then you're like, I can deal with that for now. You know, fine tune it later. Exactly. So also the menu settings, speaking of not wanting to go into the menu settings, uh, touch operation for menu status is really cool because now I can just go into my status and make changes to like frame rate or ISO or my format, uh, codec, and then image or scan mode. The biggest, the biggest one there is being able to change the um, your imager from full frame to super 35 um, and back and forth because you sometimes you need to extend the lens. <laughs> That's um, right. Yeah. In, when you're in the heat of battle and you're shooting a documentary and you might have one lens on, but you just, you can't, you don't have time to change it. Just did it. There you go. That is a nice, nice feature. I love to see this in there. Anything that helps someone shoot fast is. Exactly. And if somebody's coming from the Venice, so the, the layout is the same on the um, Venice menu as well as the main status of the FX9. So changing things like frame rate, uh, your ISO, your shutter speed, ND filter, the LUT, and the white balance are all laid out in the same uh, style as the Venice menu. So having it as a B camera really comes in handy because then you can actually work on um, the FX9 real quick. You don't have to learn a new menu system. You know. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, people who use both, thanking you right yeah. now. <laughs> uh, so if you go further into the status menu, you can actually change things like audio status, uh, system status, and also video output or where your LUTs are going to as well. Oh, great. That's nice and easy. Yeah. And then some extra additional updates. We are now um, enabling the 6G SDI output. So originally the FX9 could do 12G SDI output, but that was only for 4K 60p or 50p. But if you took it 4K 24p or 30p, it wouldn't work. Uh, 
So now the output uh, from that one 6G output can uh, get you 4K 23.98 or 2430p uh, at 4K to either an external recorder or to a switcher or uh, wherever you need to just output instead of using four cables as you would have to do originally with an F55, for example. Now you can do um, just one cable with a 6G SDI. Okay. Now the slot in wireless, as I was mentioning with the XDCA, one of the other features that you get with it besides the RAW is being able to support uh, the DWX and the URX series microphones for wireless lavalier or handheld mics. Um, and then that just gets powered from the camera so you don't have to worry about you know batteries or anything on the receiver side of it. Um, and it's uh, really really an, an additional feature that you know will will make it more of a ENG running gun type of uh, camera as well. so. No, cause that's great. Anything to make life easy, anything to streamline um, for a shooter is just, you know, anything that, first of all, Sony does audio really well with, within their cameras, between their hot shoes and everything else. And I yeah. love to see these features, and I wish more people would do this. Sony, of course, benefits from having the Sony line of audio that they have now incorporated, have and in, are incorporating to the FX9. And I just love to see more incorporation of that because it's you can't have one or the other. You have to have both. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that. Yeah, because the audio is amazing, um, and the technology behind it is is just part. You know, it, it's people people who try it out never go back really. And uh, we're also adding this new adapter, which allows you to get two additional XLRs uh, digitally into the FX9. Uh, so first, it was limited only to the MI shoe or the wireless mics. And now with this, you can actually get two additional to the XLR inputs that you already have to get all of your four channels. So that's a, another cool feature being supported with, with version two. That's nice. You know, some people might think like four channels, two channels is sometimes hard to manage on your own, but four channels, yeah. if you shoot a reality show or any, like I did one for like a car reality show and yeah. I felt like I was always like weighed down with mics you know, tied to the back of the camera. And you'd be surprised when you have like three camera people or four camera people and you need to mic up everyone. It's, uh, things start getting tethered around pretty fast and having multiple inputs just without the cabling can make life really easy. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's really nice to have that, those, those options too. Um, because some people say, why do you need four channels? And you're right. In a reality show, it's a perfect example. Um, or if, you, if you're doing like a concert and you want to get line input from the, from the council, uh, mixing council, you can, you can do that as well. So, yeah, it's definitely uh, it's nice to have those extra channels there. If, I'll, if you I'll be it. honest. Two, some cameras them. do two channels only. And, um, uh, you know, it's just, it's just not enough anymore because you might have two people mic'd up. And then you might want like just a scratch track or whatever yeah. that you need. Cause you, you might be off shooting a shot there. It's hard to take a mic off someone now, you know, you might leave it on for hours on end and you might say, get a shot of river and you might need that sound. You don't need someone talking over it and you don't want to take anything off. Cause then your sound guys are going to get pissed, but you know, yes. <laughs> it's, so these are all, these are all the updates. These are all the updates. Yeah, so we're looking at a release of October 2020. Uh, it's going to be free of charge. Um, and this is basically the summary of everything that, that you're going to be getting with version 2. Now, that could change. We could add more things uh, before then. Um, and so we're hoping that we'll keep listening to the customer and see what they need uh, and then put, it, put those features in there. Okay. So that's one of the benefits of being able to do these, these uh, version upgrades. I mean, they're, they're – they, take a long time because it is a lot of work for the engineers in Japan and but it is it is worth it for the customer because they're getting all these new features at free of charge and upgrading their their camera uh, basically well is thank you for showing us the new updates to the Venice and to the FX9 we have thanks Brian thanks for your time man yeah we have 16-bit linear raw recording coming to the FX9 down the line we have I Auto that's Focus. right we have the new dot ART I'll be honest, I went to art school. I love that dot .art. You like that? Yeah. See, that's great. It's going to be very popular. It's going to be adding the art from all of the, the experienced colorists and the muscle behind Technicolor, which is going to be amazing. Yeah, I can't wait to see it all uh, implemented. I can't wait for October to um, for this release. Thank you again. Thanks, Brian. I really appreciate it.